Hey, I, I think a lot of times in our lives we like to compare ourselves to other people. And I've always said that we tend to compare ourselves to someone, let's say we're going to compare ourselves in our, our, uh, our walk with God. We never want to compare ourselves with someone that appears to be walking on a different level, maybe what we perceive as a higher level than we are. We always want to compare ourselves to someone that maybe we perceive as a little bit on a lower level than us because it makes us feel good. And then we get into the question as we've, we've talked the last several weeks about follow me and we're going to be here a couple more weeks and, and what does Jesus and what does it mean to follow Jesus, to follow me like he said when he, he called out his first disciples and he's calling each and every day to people, follow me, follow me. And we get into these comparisons and we think in order to be a super Christian, we have to be maybe this missionary that has traveled the world and, and, and done nothing but missionary work their entire life. Or maybe we look and to be a super Christian, I've got to be Billy Graham. Or to be a super Christian, I've, you know, there's nothing else I do except just the work of God and nothing else. That's how you become a super Christian. And then we say, God, what is the purpose of my life? What is the purpose you have for me? And really, the question is probably, well, it is not. The question is not, what is your purpose for my life, God? The question is, am I willing to follow what his purpose is for my life? And that gets tough, doesn't it? Because maybe the design that we think we have for our life and what we ought to be doing with our life and this plan that I made out and that we drill into our children that you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to get this education, you've got to do this, you've got to get this training. When first we ought to say, God, what is your plan for my life? And let me mold myself around your plan for me. Instead of looking at God and saying, here's my plan, God, now make it fit into yours. That's not the way it works. It's not the way it should work. And I believe when we do that and we put God in a certain place and we say, God, you have to match up to my desires or my plans or my design, we will miss more blessings than we will ever receive when I am going on my own plan. So the question is not, what is your purpose for me, God? But am I willing to follow what his purpose is? Am I willing to write a blank check? Now, church, this, this is not only us as individuals. This is a message to the church this morning. Are we willing to write a blank check to God? We have baby dedication every now and then. And I always describe that to the parents that you're writing a blank check. If you're serious, if we're really serious when we look at baby dedication and what that means, you are writing a blank check to God about your child. And let me tell you what baby dedication is not. It's not baptism. It's not. Baby dedication in the church is simply saying we as parents... <clears throat> want God's plan for our children, and we're going to try to raise our child and lead our child in the way God would have us to do that. And it's also a commitment by the church to say, we are going to continually pray for you as you parent this child, and we're going to pray for the child, and we're going to help come along beside you and help you raise this child in the way God wants that child raised. In other words, I'm saying, God, what is your plan for my child's life? Because I want my child to follow that. But the same goes for us adults. And it goes for the church. Am I willing to follow what God's plan is for us in our lives and for our church? Listen, when we start following God and what his plan is instead of our plan, it will turn things upside down. It will make us probably question 
I don't see how this can happen. I don't see how this is going to work. But if we are following God and staying in the center of his plan for us, it will always work out the way God wants it to work out. So this morning, there are 10 reasons why we must give God a blank check, individually and as a church. Number one, because Jesus is worthy of absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. Acts is, uh, and that's where we're going to be. If, you, if you've not grabbed that yet, jump over to Acts, the first chapter. We're going to be in the first 11 verses there. So as you turn there, again, because Jesus is worthy of absolute surrender. Acts is actually a continuation of the book of Luke. And it's kind of Luke 2 instead of Acts is kind of what it is there. But Luke makes it very clear that we are to give complete absolute surrender to Christ. If you read Luke, that's what you're going to continually hear there. If I flip over to Luke... Uh, the ninth chapter, the 23rd and the 24th verse, it says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. I'm going to go on a little further. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words of him Will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels? But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. We're to be completely, totally surrendered to Jesus because he is worthy of that. It is unconditional commitment. If you look at the 10th chapter of Luke, the first through the third verse, it tells us there, Jesus says, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Lambs don't hang around with wolves. They don't like it. But guess, because it's not good. But guess what? That is where Jesus is calling us to be. He is calling us to be among the wolves, telling the wolves about the shepherd. I am a lamb among wolves, telling them about my shepherd. Complete surrender. There was a lady in Baltimore. Completely surrendered her life to Christ. No matter what it required of her. She never married. She never had any children. She was completely surrendered to the will of what God's plan was for her life. Hundreds, if not thousands of churches across North America are because of this lady's total surrender to what God's plan was. Ministries opened up to Jewish and Italian neighborhoods that were kind of shunned at that time. Schools were started for orphans and for the less fortunate families. Ministries to, again, Italian families, and one of the first Ministries reaching out to mountain people, Appalachian people included. She wrote over 18,000 letters in one year to the churches in this country, telling them to the state conventions and things, telling them about the work of what's going on in North America. And when she saw that another missionary had not in China had not been on furlough, had not had a single day off, in 11 years, she started reaching out, sending letters, going and speaking wherever she could to raise money so that this missionary could have time off. She had complete surrender. And that missionary that had not had that time off was Lottie Moon. And she started raising money to send one missionary to help and wound up raising enough money to send multiple missionaries to help Lottie Moon. And she did all that, and she started what is known now in the, Baptist, the Southern Baptist Convention as the Women's Missionary Union. And on its 50th anniversary, she passed. And that's Annie Armstrong. 
That's who we're going to be taking up a collection, our Easter offering, offering that you're going to hear John talk more about coming up. But Annie had total, complete surrender for her life to God and what his plan was. And the impact that had worldwide. Think about that. A young lady in Baltimore had that kind of international impact to this day because she was completely surrendered to the call of God on her life and what his plan was, not hers. Number two, because Jesus is working to advance his kingdom. Jesus is working to advance his kingdom. Look at Acts there, the first chapter, the first verse. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Go, go right there and underline that word began or circle it or highlight it, whatever you want to do there. Because it said the work that Jesus began to do. Because if we come down, if we come down a few verses more, down to verse 11, Jesus is gone. He's not here anymore. He's not on earth physically here. How is this going to continue without him? That had to be the thought. What are we going to do? But he continues through the lives of his people. And I think sometimes we like to view that, well, when you say he continued that through the lives of the people, you're talking about people in the Bible. Yeah, I am. But I'm talking about people sitting in the chairs of this sanctuary. I'm talking about city, people sitting or working or in church in this state, this country, this world. God continues to use people if we will allow him to use us. If you look in there, I've listed, you'll see that when you get home, you can look in that multiple verses there where God continued to use the lives of people to impact the kingdom, to advance his kingdom. And these are people that were completely surrendered to him. And when we surrender to him, we see things like happen in the Bible. We see 3,000 coming to him after one sermon. We see 5,000 being fed and 5,000 coming to him to know Christ and putting their faith in him because Jesus is working to advance his kingdom. Number three, because Jesus has clothed every single one of us with his power. Every one of us in here, he has clothed us with his power. Luke, the 24th chapter, the 49th verse, Jesus tells his disciples, I, I just want you to stay right here until you're clothed with the, uh, with the power from on high. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. And when we see that word clothed, it means literally to put it on, to cover yourself over, to be wrapped in the Holy Spirit. Clothes, these are just not, these are not clothes from the mall. These are clothes from above, provided by God himself. The Holy Spirit just wrapping us up and empowering us. Acts, the uh, first chapter there, the eighth verse. Let's read that. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The Spirit of the living God indwells within us when we place our faith in him. That same power that Jesus is talking about right here in the book of Acts is that same power that is in us. Listen, church, we don't need signs and wonders. We need men and we need women that are willing to live with total abandonment to God. We need men and women living with total abandonment to the will of God. I think we like to sit back and, well, I'd like to see some signs and I'd like to see some wonders. Hey, that's what they did in the New Testament too. There was people that would just follow him around because they saw what he had done. Hey, what's he going to do next? Maybe, maybe Jesus is a one-trick pony. 
Maybe that's the way they kind of looked at it. And kind of limited him to that and to what he could do for me or could do for them. When we need to live with total abandonment for him and his will for our life. And how can we do that? Look at the next, the next thing. Number four, because Jesus has given every single one of us the same purpose. <clears throat> every one of us in here has the same purpose. What is that? Go back to verse 8 again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Listen to that. And you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We are to lead people to Jesus. Lead them to Jesus. Point them in his direction. Make sure that the words we use in our conversations are pleasing and pointing to Jesus. Making sure that our actions are leading to Jesus and pointing because people are watching how we live as Christians. It's more than a Sunday morning thing or a Wednesday night thing. It's a 24-7 clothing of the Holy Spirit, and we are to point people to Jesus. We are to write him a blank check. Acts, the 20th chapter, the 24th verse says this. Let me get over there. The 20th chapter, the 24th verse says this, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. It is our purpose to point people, to lead people to Jesus. It is, we have the gospel, so let's share the gospel. The gospel is living in us Share it with people. Tell them about Jesus. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Some of you are going to hear something differently than what I mean here. We don't need big buildings to tell people about Jesus. We don't. You know, I know in the seminaries right now, they're teaching that you don't need a fancy, when they're talking to church, teaching church planners, you don't need a big fancy building. If anything, you need really good lighting. That's what they say. The buildings don't mean anything. You know, God may be calling people to get rid of things. There are churches that I've read about that God said, sell the building. I'm not saying that. Don't, don't hear me wrong, please. But God may be saying, sell the building. Get out in the world. Sheep, hey, lambs, get out amongst the wolves. Tell them about me. Let me tell you the worst plan. <laughs> if your plan is, hey, come hear my preacher, it's not a good plan. It is all of our responsibilities to tell people about Jesus. Number five, because the world is our goal. The world is our goal. The eighth verse there in chapter one, again, tells us, we are to see the gospel. We are to share the gospel and take it into the entire world. That's what's happening there. And 2,000 years later, there are still millions of people who've never heard the gospel of Jesus. That's why it's so important that we tell and that we support those who go out into the world and tell people about Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. We're to do that. Number six, because the world is our guarantee. Because the world is our guarantee. We're going by what the word says, and the word will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled. Matthew, the 24th chapter, the 14th verse and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. We're to go tell it. We're to go tell it. And when everybody hears it, the end will come. Now, please don't take the attitude 
Well, I, I don't want to go today, so I ain't telling anybody. No, we're to tell. We're to tell. Look at, I, I, I want to read this to you. Revelations, the seventh chapter. The ninth and the tenth verse. There's probably some of y'all in here can quote this. Y'all been studying Revelation. After I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hand and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It belongs to him. We are to share the gospel because when we get to heaven, there's going to be multitudes of people. There's going to be all races, all levels of economic people there. But here's the bottom line. None of that will matter. We will be in the presence of Jesus, the one who went to the cross to pay the price for each and every one of our sins. We will be in his presence singing praise and honor and worship to him. And I don't know what we're going to be singing. I just know it's going to be good. I sometimes wonder, you know, I hear people, we, <laughs> we talk about the different styles of music. Martin Luther says the music ministry is the war department of the church. And when we think about that, sometimes I think it's because I, I want to sing what I want to sing. You know, there's some things I, I like more than others. I like all music. But if it is bringing worship to God, if it is bringing my praise to God, I don't care what style it is. I just want to sing to him. And I sometimes wonder if maybe it won't be like the second chapter of Acts, the first 13 verses, that when we get there and we start singing, we're just singing. And we're singing in a language that, he understands and that we enjoy because we're honoring and worshiping and praising him. We're to bring it to him. Number seven there, because the stakes are high. The stakes are high. The second, I'm going to flip over here to the second chapter of Acts, the 37th through the 41st verse. Listen to this. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from the crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. The stakes are so high. This church, this is no game. This is serious, straight-up business. And we are to be about the business of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a life and death situation. I'm in the emergency room a lot over at UT, not as a patient, but I'm, I'm over there a lot, in and out. And if I happen to be in the trauma bay when trauma comes in, it is like, it's like disturbing a fire ant bed. There's like 30 people, and they're all gathered around one person, maybe. If there's five, five victims to that trauma, then there's five groups of 20 or 30 people. And they're giving it all. They're working. They're trying to fix a problem. They're trying to bring this person possibly back to life. And everybody is intent on that one person, church. We ought to attack with the same, the same energy at sharing Jesus with people and telling this world about a Savior. It is life 
and death. And if they don't hear it and they die without the word of Christ, without the opportunity, church, that is on us. It is. It's on us. Don't be selfish with it. I mean, if you had the cure for the worst disease and your child got that disease and you knew how to get rid of it, you'd tell them, wouldn't you? Listen, that's a physical death. There's something far worse, spiritual death. This is straight up serious business because the stakes are high. That is why we write a blank check because the stakes are so high. Everyone, everyone ought to go into the second chapter. Here's what I challenge you this week alone. I want you to, sometime this week, go to the second chapter of Acts, and I want you to read the first 13 verses. The first 13 verses. And see how things got turned upside down early on in the church. It completely got upside down because, number eight, the Spirit's here. The Spirit is here. I want you to read that this week and think about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit being here. This is a one-time occurrence in the church. And Jesus had said, had said, stay right here, and the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. And then all of a sudden, the sound of a rushing wind. And then it appears, tongues like fire, a split tongue, or over them. And there's a multitude of people, and they start hearing these guys start talking, and they hear it in their own language. There were people from every kind of tribe and land there, and they start hearing preaching in their own language. Now, the first thing they thought is, Aren't these, these Galileans, are they drunk? And they're like, no, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. God shows up. Listen, that same spirit that did that is the same spirit that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that same spirit enters us. We are empowered with that same spirit. The same God that did that is the same God that will fill us. It's incredible. 2,000 years later that that, trust me, go read this this afternoon, the second chapter, the first 13 verses. That same Holy Spirit indwells in us. That's incredible if you think about it. And we're to tell people about Jesus because he is here. He's here today. And that same spirit is here today. Number nine. Because the glory of God or the glory of Christ leaves us no other option. It leaves us no other option. He is the risen Savior. He, Jesus, is the risen Savior. We want him to be known. He wants to be known. Listen, I've kind of said it, and I've heard this said a hundred times. It's kind of cliche. Jesus is a gentleman's gentleman. He will not force himself on you. He will give you a simple decision to make. And he wants you to know him he wants to be known. He wants to be in relationship with us. He wants us to be together with him. Our greatest joy is when Christ is glorified. That is our greatest joy. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and that's why we write a blank check to him. Because anything less will not do. It will not do. Number 10, because the coming of Christ leaves us with great anticipation. It leaves us with great anticipation. 
first chapter of Acts, 8 through 11. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said this, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is why we write a blank check, to make him known because he is coming back. Did you hear what I said? They stood there because he left. I don't know what was going through their head. I can only imagine. But we're coming into that season to where we really concentrate and we observe Easter and we see that Jesus is taken. He is, he is put into a, a crazy court system. He is convicted. He is crucified. He is buried. And everybody thought it stopped right there. But three days later, he, raised, he rises up again. He goes into heaven. And the verse says there, what I want you to do is underline it because it will come in the same way or will come back. Whatever version you got, underline that because the bottom line is he's coming back. You know, when Jesus was out, we talked last week or week before last, <clears throat> when Jesus was out on the water, the, the disciples went out ahead of him in a boat and they were out there and a storm comes up. And, and you know, all of a sudden, one of them, I imagine this is what happens, <clears throat> stands up in the boat and looks and they see somebody coming across the water. And they remembered when they left, Jesus said, I'll meet you there. And I, can, I can imagine one of them standing up in the front of that boat looking out there going, hey guys, uh, did, did Jesus say how he's going to get here? No, why? Because he's coming. He's coming. And are you ready this morning? Are you willing to write a blank check and say, God, whatever your will is for my life, I'm willing to obey it 100%. I know I'm going to fail, but God, I'm willing to write you the check because God, you provided payment for my sin on an old rugged cross. The, the cross that should have been mine, you put your son you told him to go, and he was completely sold out. Jesus wrote a blank check to his father and says, I will surrender total abandonment for the will of my father. Church, individuals, are we willing to write that blank check and be completely sold out, abandoned to his will only? Because let me tell you, it's going to cost you something going to cost you something. Everybody is going to cost them something different. Church, it's going to cost all of us something collectively. But it says he's coming back. And when he comes back, guess why he's coming back? He's coming to get me. He's coming to get those who have put their faith in him. If you're still here, he's coming. He's coming and we're going home. Where everything's going to be perfect. The temperature's going to be perfect. The food's going to be perfect. My house is going to be perfect. There ain't going to be a leaky roof. He's going to be in control. Listen, what is your will? Or what is God's will for your life? And will you surrender to it? Friday and Saturday, I was in South Georgia. And I was kind of doubting about going. I kind of felt like, I, need, I really need, I'm going down to help train umpires with the Southeast region. And I was like, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. I was kind of hesitating. I got down there yesterday morning, about 15 to 8, we're out on the field. Everybody's getting ready to start. This guy comes up to me. He says, Mark, can, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. So I start thinking, okay, get that rule book rolling in your head. He's just going to ask you a rule so I'm thinking about, okay, where's he going? Where's he going? <clears throat> and he kind of hesitated a little bit. And I said, I'll just ask it. I said, there's no dumb questions. 
He said, I, I need to talk to you about my faith. And it threw me so off. Because now I'm like, whoa, wait, he's not talking, he's not talking about the rule book. He's not talking about a mechanic here. He said, I need to talk to you about my faith. He said, I've been, I've been watching your church online. I said, really? He said, yeah. And he says, I've really got some questions about my faith. And I need to talk to you. And I said, man, we'll talk whenever you want to. And I knew right then I was right where God needed me to be that day. Listen, are we sold out to the will of God? Have we written a blank check? I hope so. And are we willing to be obedient to it? Will you stand? God, we love you so much. God, I pray that we as a church are completely sold out to you, God. That we write you a blank check, and then when you call that check in, God, we're going to be obedient to what you ask of us. Obedient to your leading. God, if there's those here today, someone may not know you, have never placed their faith in you. I, I pray, Lord, that this morning be the day that they come to know you and your Holy Spirit will indwell in them as a result. We love you so much.